All right, everyone. We're today joined again by Greg Rimke of EconomicThinking.org, and he's here to talk about the NCFCA team policy resolution about reforming the federal court system. You might not think of that as naturally an economic topic, but in reality, economics is all about decisions and incentives and people. And that's why the science of economics has expanded far beyond the financial realm alone and applies to all matters of systems and the interplay between people and incentives in the federal court system is right at the heart of those sorts of decisions. Greg, thanks for being with us today. Uh, please go ahead and let us know, what, what are your first impressions on this topic? What do you think of it? Well, the first thing, like most students, I tried to figure out what people meant by federal court system, and I looked at the uh, discussion with the resolution. Um, in the field of economics, there's a whole field of law and economics. Uh, economics is looking at incentives that people face, information problems, the issue of scarce resources. Um, so the federal court system you know, it has got a limited budget. They've got to make decisions about how they spend their money. So there's those sorts of things that economists look at. Um, you know, the federal government, state governments are involved in education. They don't do that necessarily so well. So from our standpoint as, or for the student standpoint as homeschoolers, um, how could you look critically at the federal government's operation of the courts the same way they might look critically at the federal government's operation of, you know, Obamacare or the, the state school systems or others? So just we're looking at management issues to start with. I see. So we have to think of the courts not necessarily from a policy framework alone of what did policymakers intend them to be, but how they actually operate and process backlogs and manage even their job functions, titles, and roles, and those sorts of things are a big part of the topic. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to look at those. And so there's a number of books where economists look at the court system. Richard Posner, uh, a federal court judge, is a leading economist in, in law and economics. Uh, Randy Barnett is a legal scholar as well as an economist. Uh, so what I've been trying to do is look at sort of books and, and talk to people I know and see what things they might suggest. In my blog posts on this topic, I've looked, I've tried to just sort of look at a number of different issues. Uh, this is a quick um, separation of powers. You know, mm -hmm. sort of the reason we have a court system is to separate our executive, judicial, and legislative branches of government. So my first post on this was to look at, you know, regulation. We have all these federal regulatory agencies, and they have their own court systems mm -hmm. inside. So the IRS has its own court system. The EPA has its own court system. Now, resolution-wise, topic-wise, does that count as topical when we talk about federal court systems? Uh, one could argue that uh, court systems for our federal bureaucracy or these, these agencies should be in the judicial branch right. rather than in the executive branch. That would be sort of one example of looking at both legal theory and what's grown up as a fairly large regulatory state. So the EPA is prosecuting and judging at the same time inside of their system? Each of these federal agencies, it's, it has its own police forces, and many of them have their own judicial systems. Sometimes they're in the Department of Justice, but the Department of Justice, it seems... They're judicial. the chief prosecutors. <laughs> yeah, they're in the executive branch. Yeah. So uh, there are... It's one of the issues to look at, is, is should you allow the... the regulatory agencies, like this new uh, consumer regulatory agency that's set up with Elizabeth Warren, well, are they going to actually have their own judges to adjudicate whether people have or haven't violated their regulations? That judicial process should be in the court system, not in the executive branch. Hmm. Do you think that the, uh, because this is a pretty recent trend, right? Well, it only since the, uh, that's a good question. I'm not, when these, there's always been a constitutional debate about these agencies that are formed by the executive branch, passed legislation passed, but the legislation seems to give these uh, regulatory agencies the ability to interpret the law themselves, right? So they create their own legislation, um, uh, like the Affordable Care Act. That's legislation passed mm -hmm. by Congress, but the ACA itself is issuing huge amounts of additional uh, 
legislation in a sense to interpret it and then who adjudicates disputes. So those those sorts of questions have been around a long time, but it's grown dramatically as the executive branch has grown dramatically. That's fascinating. So what what about turning to some of the other parts of the system, you know, uh, uh, other than the executive branch? What do you think about the system itself? And we've had some 200 and some odd years to observe its development. It's become very precedent-based and almost notorious for how long it takes to achieve justice. Are there economics principles at play there that can be used to solve some of those problems? Um, yeah, you could look at just the general management. I mean, first off, when you're guaranteed by the Constitution for a you know a speedy trial uh, with a jury, um, in the system now we don't have juries, right? There's no juries in 95 percent of federal cases, federal criminal cases. So why is that? Well. The judicial branch itself, um, the way the courts operate, the prosecutors, uh, they have uh, juries take time. They're complicated. They're, so they prefer not to have juries. So they've evolved their own system not to have juries. Hmm. Now, to some extent, that's you, the economics of it means that you don't, the, the prosecutors get to decide, get to run the show themselves. And they have a very high conviction rate because uh, people plead guilty because if they ask for a jury trial, um, they can expect a much heavier sentence if they lose. So you could call it blackmail, but it's sort of gambling on the part. So that's an example of something that uh, is the preference of the prosecutors, um, but it's not necessarily, it's not what the, the founders of the Constitution want. It's not the common law legal process. So what we're really seeing is that possibly for efficiency reasons, which is economy, and maybe others, uh, there's basically you need to opt out of the system that you're afforded in order to have a reasonable time frame and cost associated with your trial. And so people are just using this as wheeling and dealing uh, to, to speed through the system. Yeah, the prosecutors say they don't have time to take everything to a jury, so this is the only way they can handle their caseload. Um, but if it's an unjust system by not having a jury, then you should put more resources perhaps in the court system and, and allow them to have more people, more trials, if that's the case. But right now, you're giving prosecutors discretion over how they're going to handle it, and the system, the legal system, is supposed to have a jury. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, and so I have a post on that. Uh, uh, so that's one of the examples of the incentives. If you, if you let the prosecutors decide how to run the system, they'll run it without juries because juries are slow things down and they often, they can lose to a jury. Right. But the system is not supposed to be just an administrative court without juries. So that's something where there's economics involved in terms of the incentives of the players. Uh, but it also ties into the war on drugs and sort of overloading the system with uh, you know huge numbers of uh, people who've been uh, accused of crimes. And, and by the way, the they're, this is the right on crime, rightoncrime.com. These are conservatives. many laws, and that gives too much discretion to the government to decide who they're going to arrest or prosecute. Right. As Cicero said, the more laws, the less justice, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, just every, not a week goes by with a whole new set of these new laws they're trying to uh, put on overtime pay. So I don't know if you're concerned about whether you pay your employees overtime uh, in ethos, but you might be breaking the law at every single one of your debate hmm. camps because your workers work more than eight hours a day. Right. Well, that's not legal. Right. So do they get time and a half, double time? And oh, man. So then you've got to hire a lawyer. And, and, and this yeah. all, it's sort of no problem until somebody gets upset. And then they file a grievance, and then you're in a whole world of hurt. So sure. no, it's a notorious part of the business world is, 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 is it's a lottery. Is, you know, the, the amount of cost that it takes to do everything that you really should do it's almost impossible to understand as a small business owner from the beginning. I remember a couple of years back, uh, they waived this afterwards, um, and I was glad because I, I couldn't find a way to comply with it. 
they'd come up with this idea that you have to issue a, um, uh, not a 1099, uh, maybe a 1099, to every company you had spent more than $600 with. So I'd have to literally get the tax ID info and process paperwork through the IRS and uh, send it to Best Buy and Apple computers and, you know, everywhere. Uh, and, and that thought as a small business owner, you know, that's, it probably is going to cost me my annual revenue just to comply. And I was like, that, that can't work. So that's so that's in the, the latest post I did on, on economic freedom issues. The whole idea of the federal government regulating, you know, who can work for whom and under what conditions and what reporting procedures, it's done in the name of helping the worker, or helping the disadvantaged, or, or safety, or some other reason. Which are legitimate but, points. Yeah, there's lots of reasonable things there, but but these are kinds of economic regulations that the court that the federal government was seen not to have the power of doing, and these came about in the New Deal. So a big part of this topic is sort of looking at economic regulations, uh, looking at the, the, the Bill of Rights, the Ninth Amendment, the Tenth Amendment. Uh, we've created uh, a lot of new regulations, and, you know, advocates say these are good things, they help people, they're designed to help people, but they have the unintended consequence of making it hard for anybody who's not a lawyer or doesn't have access to a friend or a relative who's a lawyer. This is this is really powerful to negative teams, I think, too, because two things that I've heard is that, you know, I, we already know that many people are going to run cases on jury trials, but if that's only 5% of the time to begin with, then, you know, there's there's some issues with that. And then second of all, you mentioned unintended consequences, and we've got a really good one in business. But these are great generic strategies to have as negative, that if you can link an affirmative case into some sort of unintended consequence that's massive, uh, they they maybe ought to have balanced the priorities of their case difference. So what are some other unintended consequences besides effects on business that you think uh, affirmative teams are likely to trip the wires on? Um. Well, the, I guess the back, maybe this response to your question and, and trying to look at the alternatives, you have conservatives who've long called for uh, uh, the judicial system to be um, to, to sort of hands off. They're against judicial activism because the argument was during the uh, uh, 60s and 70s, the court started to legislate. They were legislating from the bench to push all sorts of modern liberal reforms. So conservatives, Ed Meese at the Heritage Foundation and others said, look, we need judicial restraint. Robert Bork was off the school. Hmm. Uh, and let the legislators make these, let them do the legislation and the court just will step back. Well, now the federal government is so large, uh, Randy Barnett and other modern sort of classical liberals are saying we need a kind of principled judicial activism. We need the court to step in and invalidate laws that are, you know, seem pretty clearly to be unconstitutional. They want to be deferential to the legislature, but if the this is the case with the raisin, the California, what government was telling raisin farmers that they could grow raisins or grapes make raisins, but they had to give a certain amount of them to the state, and the Supreme Court said, well, that's just a taking. That's taking private property without uh, compensation. So that was the court invalidating a regulation that was there for economic reasons or whatever reasons. Uh, but, but these sorts of uh, more active efforts by the court to invalidate economic interventions. This was what Obamacare was about. Right. People said, look, there are various reasons why this you know, seemed to be unconstitutional. But had the court done that, they would have obviously caused a political firestorm on one side. But principal judicial activism, how do you make the federal court system more actively protect our economic liberties? Hmm. They protect our political liberties in the sense that if you're a group of Nazis, you can march through the Jewish part of town and freedom of speech, and those are sort of sacrosanct. But the Constitution doesn't differentiate between civil and economic liberties. Um, the, so the argument is the court should protect those as well. Answer do you think that uh, is principled judicial activism a phrase that's being used that if people search will bear fruit or are there other terms that you saw associated with it uh, this is the one more recent uh, uh, I just posted yeah. today on it okay. uh, Jim Huffman who was the head of the law school at Lewis and Clark College had written 
gave a talk at the Heritage Foundation on this some years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's, again, you have the, if you, for example, if you say the court should be active, who's to say they're going to be active in the things that conservatives or classical liberals want rather than the things that uh, left liberals or modern uh, social welfare advocates want? So the concern is, you know, which way is the court going to go and, and how do you restrain them if, uh, if they go in the direction you don't like? So that's, that's the challenge of giving too much power to the court. But again, what does the Constitution say? What are the, what are the words in the Constitution and how do we sort of recover those protections for economic freedom that we used to have, hmm. used to take for granted? So you think that it's valuable probably for students to go back to Article 3 and really understand where the federal court system came from in the first place in order to make this argument. Um, that is, that is although, Article 3, right? Well, the court, the court system, you know, the, you've got the structure of the court. This is why this is a, a challenge to me in researching this. Mm-hmm. The things that I've written about, it's hard for me to know which are the court system and which are the ideas that legal scholars have in their minds right. from law school, from uh, law review. Right, articles. you have a body of theory out here, and then you have Title 28, which is civil kind of procedure, and then you have the Federal Criminal Justice Code, I, I forget what it's called, and yeah, there's a weird mix of all that, and then the Constitution's there sideways, so I, I yeah, it, and they all get to review and decide, is this or is this not applicable to us? And you have split decisions going up the appellate level, whether they can even look at a, a given issue or not. Right. So, you, so the negative could say, look, this isn't a problem of the federal court system needing reform. This is a problem of the very ideas that are discussed and debated in the Constitution. Uh, and so, you know, these principles that the founders understood, that were understood by legal scholars, these need to be revived, both on the justice level of the people people's rights should be protected, and on the practical level. Mm-hmm. It's important to understand that the Supreme Court's um, allowing a lot of the New Deal legislation was in an atmosphere of fear. That is to say, unless we let the government regulate things, the entire economy might collapse. Right? Unless we let the government decide maximum work week and this and that, then we could have chaos. So those fears we now know to be unfounded. That is to say, the, the problems of the New Deal, the, the Great Depression, were caused by a lot of the interventions in the system. So the legal power that the federal government took in the time of crisis, the New Deal, um, we can now go back and say, well, these powers weren't necessary, they're destructive, uh, the federal government should give up the power to you know, regulate work weeks or give up the power to tell states how to do this and how to do that. Fascinating. Um, my appetite has been whet to, you know, more than just the theoretical justice side of this topic, which is the system is a behemoth and it is complex, sometimes bizarre, uh, but certainly struggles with efficiency. And all of that is tied up into really an economy of how justice is served, not simply the, the ideas that, you know, we're implementing this time. Right. Here's a, here's a quick example of uh, incentives. Um, You've got the court systems at the state and federal level, and then you've got uh, the, the, the crime lab. The crime lab is where they test you know, substances, hair, and one thing and another. And economists would say if the crime lab is part of the local, if the prosecutor runs the crime lab or the police department funds and runs the crime lab, um, you've got a problem because the incentives of the crime lab are to support the prosecutor. Mm-hmm. And so we just found out that I don't know how many dozens of people that have been thrown in jail, uh, convicted of crimes because of an hair analysis, that all of that, virtually all of that analysis was fraudulent. The crime labs that did it didn't have the technology to do it, and they just sort of made stuff up. Wow. And so that pretend evidence was used to convict people. In, uh, in Houston, the crime lab there was turned out to be fraudulent, and they, there was a huge number of convictions that came from that. Now... As a federal court system at the federal level, the crime lab should be independent of the prosecutors. So if the prosecutor gets something and wants something analyzed, he can go get it analyzed from a crime lab. The federal government or private companies can provide that service. But if you have those people's pay dependent on whether the prosecutor likes them right. or somebody in the Department of Justice, you've got an incentive problem. 
yeah, it's like it's like federal contracting and wars. Yeah. If suddenly it's profitable to be unjust, well, that's what humans will find a way to do. Yeah, the, 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 these incentives have a have a have a negative effect and have an effect if they're if they're not working right. So the, there's a significant amount of injustice in the system caused by the way it's organized. Maybe it's better than other countries. Maybe it's better than it used to be in some ways, but. Economists can give you ideas of how to repair the system or how to fix it or improve it in various ways. Excellent. Well, I'm curious uh, to see what more you unpack at PhD debate camp coming up and other camps now, right? You're traveling all around the country. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you for the interview today. We'll get it up online. Uh, once again, everyone, Greg Grimke, economicthinking.org.